I might have the uh, permission of my elders to continue. I'm James. Thank you. I'm particularly uh, touched. Thank you, Mama Billy. The Thomases are a very special family among many special families in ASCAC. Um, when we were in the Nile Valley a few years ago, a couple of years ago, the Thomas girls and I had a partnership going around. I had my gardener, Egyptian grammar, and we were going through learning the language. And I'm a baby in the language, not like my, my brother, Mario Beatty, who has taken the staff and is being shaped in that language. But those young sisters uh, are really, our future's in extremely capable hands, uh, with Jamie and Debbie Thomas. As a matter of fact, in the uh, latest issue of the Sorek, which I encourage you all to get, uh, the ASCAC newsletter with Dr. Clark's picture on the front, remembering John Henry Clark, there is an article, a memorial to our new ancestor, Dr. John Henry Clark, a great and mighty walk by Jamie Thomas. Jamie, you want to stand up there, everybody see you? Thank you. So we're talking about scholarship. Buy it and get yours autographed, because we have legions. Unfortunately, last night, we were tied up at the hotel, and I didn't get to see Brother Ezekiel, but I want to see, is he here? He's not here yet, he's at school, right? Well, I'll see him today, because I have his speech in my pocket. And this doesn't reflect everything that he said. But things can move you to tears, you know? That's an amazing thing for a young person to speak your name as an inspiration. That means I have an obligation. That happened to me one other time. It happened to me a number of times in different venues. But it happened to me one other time in particular here in Detroit. And that was the last time I stood before an audience at ASCAC National. And that was when Malika Pryor did something very similar and talked about being a Nile Valley Nationalist. I haven't talked to Malika in a while. And hopefully we'll, we'll get in contact again real soon because we have an obligation to apprentice and an obligation to pass on the lessons that we've learned. Because those young people are so much further ahead of us when we were at their age that the future is in better and better hands with younger and younger groups, because a lot of babies, Mike Washington's babies here, I saw some of these babies running around, Aristide's child. There are some children here who are infants who these young people will teach. And so that intergenerational transmission of wisdom is in safe hands. And we just get better and better and better, because we get smarter and smarter as younger and younger we get. I want to um, first start the stopwatch, because I know we're on time. As I said, the last national conference that we had here in Detroit, when Dr. Carruthers continued his discourse on the Wahimi Misu and really explored that as an intellectual concept, Dr. John Henry Clark spoke to the group, and Queen Mother and Zynga placed me on the, uh, the agenda to speak at the same time as, as the elder, and I talked a little bit about these commoners are as scribes. And it seems that we've come full circle to return here to this wellspring, this one of, one of the origins of points of black nationalism, of African nationalism in this country, to revisit our ancestor, John Henry Clark. Oh, one other thing, all these people out here in the family, we all sit this family reunion every time we come together. I want y'all to formally meet uh, my brother, my biological brother, Jeff Obafemi Carr, and my biological mother, Catherine Carr. Can y'all stand up so everybody see y'all? <laughs> My mother is from the area around Tuskegee, Alabama, Phoenix City, Alabama, Opelika, Alabama, not too far from Union Springs, Alabama. And as Jerry Clark moved from Union Springs to Columbus, Georgia, Monty still lives there. So that when they attended the funeral of John Henry Clark at Gethsemane Baptist Church, that was not unfamiliar territory. And we were unfortunate. Uh, we were not able to make the physical trip, but ASCAC was there, uh, and Zynga, Larry O'Dudley Williams, many others. But we did go to New York, and that's where I want to start in this discussion very, uh, for the next hour or so, Requiem for a Timekeeper. One other thing, does anybody have any bear aspirin? Bear. If you got one, pass it forward. Tylenol, I guess, they say take bear, right? Because I, I got blood pressure. I work for the school district of Philadelphia. <laughs> and, Rich, and, and Aisha Amin McCoy and Richard Isaacs of ASCAC have taken good care of me in the few months I've been there, but I can't be there much, much longer. 
because I got to get back in the classroom, A, and B, they killing me in education administration, and I mean that very seriously. And anytime I get a ringing in my ear and I'm starting to get dizzy, I know I need to take a bear aspirin because it means I haven't eaten and I probably need to, to lessen it. If it, they say take bear, right, and maybe it's psychosomatic, so Tylenol, anything I do, I put some in my mouth, maybe my mind will take care of the rest of it. Anyway, Brother Brian, if you can hit that uh, uh, overhead, and y'all can kind of make this out. I just want to give a quick outline of the things I want to talk about uh, today. Oh, my dossier. Oh, that's fine, that's fine. My mind, it'll probably all work the same. The doctor's probably... Tell them we're doing good. That's all right. I really have an irritated stomach. Thank you. Pass it forward, please. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Because then that, would, that messed up the mind trick I was going to try to play on myself anyway. I think I kind of knew that. <laughs> Can y'all see this? You may have to dim the lights a little bit. This is the title. Requiem for a Timekeeper. It's a, se- a six-piece paper, and it stems. Thank you, sir. That's all right. That's aspirin. That's fine. Thank you. I'm a walking billboard for a number of things. One thing is black men in particular don't seem to take good care of themselves. And I know, you know, we got obligation at the same time. I'm stubborn. Thank you. It's a six piece paper that stems out of Dr. Clark's transition, which took place in July 1998, and the ritual that was held at Abyssinian Baptist Church a few days afterwards. Um, I started the paper on a napkin in St. Mark's Plaza the night after the, uh, the ritual in, in, uh, at Abyssinian Baptist Church, and continued sketching it out and have had the opportunity, thanks to the Southern region and the Mid-Atlantic region, to present sections of the paper at those two regions and also to do a little bit of it in Detroit back in December. My goal was to get to all five regions. Um, and I think that uh, you know, as we uh, work with the study group process, as we go across regions, if we can begin to submit papers and in a dialogue and share, it's very helpful because I got a lot of constructive feedback with an idea toward eventually working this into a much larger project, hence the title. But in the, the kind of introduction, or the uh, prolegomenon, I want to talk about the context of a passing. Set the scene for what happened or what I see as happened in New York. And then talk a little bit about the nature of requiem and why I picked that term. Then I want to go through Dr. Clark's life, his genealogy, his physical life as a connecting thread, a thread that kind of connects modern era Africana nationalist intellectual practice. And by practice, I simply mean work and practice, thought and practice, action and theory wedded together. Then the timekeeper as critic, the radical intervention of African and nationalist intellectual work in the era of the performer intellectual. We like to be entertained, and there are a lot of entertainers out riding the circuit. John Henry Clark was nothing if not consistent in his critique of performance over scholarship. And I want to talk about that notion of African and nationalist intellectual work in terms of what Dr. Clark provided in his life genealogy, as we'll see in section three, and see how that stands as a model for self-analysis in this kind of late capitalist age. Finally, a series of prescriptions, what must be done. By thematic exemplars, I simply mean looking at the themes which come out of Dr. Clark's written work and his speech work in terms of his the spoken and the written text. I kind of organize them in, some, in several themes that I want to kind of talk about a little bit. And finally, the coda, or the kind of closing section, the coming fetishization of John Henry Clark. Because his ancestor veneration is one thing. Reifying an ancestor and turning them into a cult hero to put on t-shirts and baseball caps is quite another thing. And I think that we probably can anticipate some of that coming fetishization. At approximately 2 o'clock PM, and you can cut that off if you want to, Brian. Well, no, that's all right. Leave it up. That's all right, because people might be writing it. Some are maybe writing it down. At approximately 2 o'clock p.m. on Thursday, January, uh, July 16, 1998, John Henry Clark joined the ancestors. Five days later, a ritual of initiation into eternity was held before several thousand Africans at Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem, New York, followed by a final ritual of transition and physical interment at Gethsemane Baptist Church in Columbus, Georgia. Bracketed by the twin geographical markers of his dual existence, John Henry Clark completed his earthly turn as he had begun it. As an African whose razor-sharp clarity often masked a turbulent voyage, 
the restlessness of which was represented in grand relief by the now bewildering breadth of cultural, political, and social types attendant at the rituals of transition. Six weeks later, before thousands of African Harlemites, assorted Africans from across the eastern seaboard and beyond, hundreds of New York City police officers, actually probably more like thousands, a much less diverse assortment of high-profile African nationalist sympathetic activists under the direction of Khalid Abdul Muhammad, convened a gathering which called itself the Million Youth March. Simultaneously, before hundreds of African politicians, organizers, and curiosity seekers over the course of three days, African political moderates convened a million youth movement in Atlanta, Georgia. In a 1995 article entitled, Why I Oppose the Million Man March, John Henry Clark sounded what became one of the central themes of his last years on earth, arguing that the crisis of African misery has always been a fertile ground for political opportunism. Clark roundly criticized Minister Louis Farrakhan for seizing upon the anxieties of Africans in America to fuel his ambitions of political, economic, and religious empire building. And it's quoting from the text. And we hope certainly send our uh, thoughts and prayers and, and, and uh, pleas to the ancestors for intervention to the family of Minister Farrakhan. As I understand, he's ill. Um, that I guess some Africans began coming in yesterday into the hotel saying that they'd heard on the radio. And, and USA Today had a little blurb today. We don't trust anything they say. Of course, the New York Times had nothing. Those Jews are all praying for the man's death. And they'll wait. You know, his, they're prepared, they certainly prepared his obituary. Probably had it ready 10 years ago. But at any rate, the, uh, USA Today at least quoted saying that the final call, it verified what some folk had been saying, that the final call had been the one who had initially made this kind of announcement. So maybe there's some credibility to the fact that he is indeed ill. What would Clark have to say to the parade of social and intellectual dignitaries who pronounced reflection upon their own post-Clark status over his inert form in the ritual at Abyssinian Baptist Church? What would he have had to say to the fragmented and less than cogent contingent who rehearsed the fatigue slogans and phrases of the African nationalist movement, the Saturday of the Million Youth Movement in his beloved Harlem? In short, to what or to who has fallen the task of the internal critic, actually that's a rhetorical question, it's fallen to us. The literal timekeeper and compass custodian of the African nationalist movement. The moment has come for those who were his juniors and students in this movement to engage in the sacred and solemn ritual of requiem, the full reflection on the meaning of a timekeeper who has entered his real earned repose. ASCAC has one of its cornerstones, the genealogy, the roll call of those intellectuals or African, uh, activist workers whose life example and textual productions form the corpus of what can usefully be referred to as the nationalist canon. How do you form a canon? How do you put together a series of essential texts, things that we should use as a blueprint? Baba Jetty, earlier today, gave us one of those blueprints in terms of the texts of the Wahemi Masu the text to which we should refer to ground ourselves in this notion of the repetition of the births. What is the logic that guides this selection process? Because everything that is not occurring in this moment occurred in the past, and we have that whole panoply of things from which to pick to build our canon. And as we build that canon, it says as much about us in the present as it does about anything we pick from the past. So what are the rules that govern how we look back, why we look back, and what we pick? from the past to build that identity that we had. As Malcolm said, I ain't no African. I ain't left nothing in Africa. The man said, you left your mind in Africa. But the process through which people say that they're not an African is the process through which they have constructed a past. Their logic is based on their historical identity in the present. And I want to say thank you to Brother Paul. Is Paul here? Paul Hill? One of the great scholars in our tradition. He gave me a bunch of newspapers that he's been writing in uh, the uh, the Michigan Citizen, and he's got an article here on Carter G. Woodson that brings tears to my eyes, one of the great historians. And Woodson's papers, Catherine Adams is in the crowd, she did some research on this, and I was able to actually follow up and, and, and look at some similar things. I guess University Press of America is getting ready to publish Carter G. Woodson's papers if they haven't already done it. And among those papers is his extensive manuscript for the Encyclopedia Africana. If you remember, you know, Henry Louis Gates, the race pimp that we've been dealing with for a while, we actually went to the university. Deb Hurd and I were in the crowd at the University of Pennsylvania but about a month ago, Deb, right about Du Bois' birthday, about three weeks ago, and saw him do a multimedia presentation on this in, in Carta Africana. 
and talk about how this project was a re reviving of the Du Bois project. And one of the things that he mentioned in passing was, of course, that Woodson wouldn't go in with Du Bois on this thing because he said, white folks giving you money, they're going to try to tell you what to do. Now, Woodson had his, had his personality, you know, quirks. We all do. But one of the things he was consistent on was African people had to build institutions, and African people had to do the work, and African people should take their own money and do it. That's how he built that network with the Negro History Bulletin, one of the great texts of our tradition. And most of the writers of that Negro History Bulletin were school teachers, African women in the South. Hazel Carby, a confused African at Yale University, has written, uh, recently written a book called Race Men, where she says black nationalists, all they talk about is the men in the tradition. And as Dr. Carruthers said when he gave the genealogy, that was just some representative names. And I might add very quickly that one of the people, one of the groups of people who have preserved our text in the Schomburg tradition were the African librarians, particularly in the South. And all of those people, with relatively few exceptions, were women. These women were in the tradition of Sachet, the mistress of books in ancient Kemet. Women like Jean Blackwell Hudson, Dorothy uh, Porter, uh, women like Hallie Q. Brown and Wilberforce, who preserved those libraries so that we have them. And those sisters are obviously in that genealogy as well as Drusilla Dungy Houston and some of the names we are, with which we're more familiar. But Carter Woodson's Encyclopedia Africana is supposed to be in, in this collection of his papers that's going to be published. So hopefully we'll be able to avail ourselves of looking at what the master uh, put down in print in terms of his concept of an Africana uh, Encyclopedia Africana. So we're talking about canon formation. How do we form a canon? The nature of Requiem. Well, Henry Louis Gates, I like, I like quoting Gates to support what we say because he, do, he isn't always incorrect. He's just a race pimp. And that's important to note because as Dr. Clark would always say, I'll go to hell and get fired to save my people if it'll help save the people. And often when we read these texts, what we find is there's often isn't much of a hair of a difference between the people who say they're for us and the people who say they're against us. And just like it works in one direction, which is a lot of times people on our team get recruited to play on other folks' team for a weekend or a nice fee or whatever they do from time to time. Similarly, we should start raiding their team so that these white folks understand, hey, you think Henry Louis Gates is your boy, let's go to the text. Let's roll the videotape and see what he says about canon formation. Henry Louis Gates says, it is incumbent upon us, those of us who respect the sheer integrity of the black tradition, <laughs> to turn to this very tradition, to turn to this very tradition, to create self-generated theories about the black literary endeavor. We must above all, this is Henry Louis Gates, we must above all respect the integrity, the wholeness of the black work of art. That's Skip Gates. Now he doesn't do that. <laughs> but he's not wrong. How do we respect that integrity? Well, one of the things we have to do in terms of Dr. Clark's passing, and I, I got a letter from a brother who's teaching at Howard University now. We went to school together. We used to call him Du Bois, a little short dude named uh, Larry Jackson. Uh, he kind of looked like Du Bois. He had a big forehead and was bald-headed like Du Bois, so we called him Du Bois. Brilliant brother. Grew up on the streets of Baltimore playing basketball. You know how Africans are. It doesn't matter. As Shelby Steele, who's also like a broke clock, Twi uh, write at least twice a day. In his most recent book, A Dream Deferred, and in interviews about the book, talks about the fact that we don't ask for affirmative action on the basketball court. You get out there, if you play, you can play. If you can't, get off. So why should we look for affirmative action in school or anywhere else? Now, of course, there are some very big fallacies in that argument. One of the things that's not fallacious is that when we feel like we can compete, we don't ask for no breaks from nobody. We just, just let me play. Who said that? I, one, one famous athlete was a Jack Tatum. I'm, he did a book, Just Let Me Play. I forget. It wasn't Willie Mays. Who? Charlie Sippert, the golfer. That's right. Thank you. Just let me play. Tiger Woods, just let me play. Don't worry about what I say about the interviews, cannibal. Whatever. Just let me play. We know how to construct Tiger Woods' identity. We don't leave that to him. He's a child anyway. We know who he is. We know what he means. Just let me play. I guess what I'm saying is that Larry Jackson was one of those brothers. Just let me play, brothers. And he played basketball on the streets of Baltimore. Hardcore brother. And he came to Dr. Clark's funeral in New York, the ritual. And he wrote me a long letter about a month later analyzing the ritual. And it made me think. Because he said, here were the people in Dr. Clark's genealogy reflecting on his life. And one of the things I shared with Larry that moment of the ritual, we were talking, I said, you know, it's funny because you got people in the room that if Dr. Clark got up and walked out, there'd be a fist fight. <laughs> ben Chavis sitting two rows next to Khalid Muhammad. 
Cornell West. White folks there, the socialist person said and get up and talk about the man's socialism. Jeb Carruthers, Asa Hilliard, and Zinger Heru doing rituals with Calvin Butts shifting from side to side as the Christian minister of Abyssinian Baptist Church. The biological families both there, politics about who sits where, and then Zinger gets up to speak. The daughter. And gives an eloquent reflection on what it means to share your biological parent with a community who needs him as a parent as well. Fascinating text to watch this ritual. Now, Larry's a cynic. Larry said, Look, you got all these Africans in this room. I'm reading this letter, fascinated, because Larry did his work on Ralph Ellison. He did his PhD on Ralph Ellison at Stanford University. So he writes in a style that white folks are comfortable with, but he's a boy from the streets, so he's got that side too. And Ellison is nothing if not in some places confused but very clear about what America did to black people, even if he doesn't confess that it did it to me. And that's I'm Exhibit A. The notion of the, of the relationship of America to black people and how we formed an identity that's informed by America. And so I understood where Larry was going when he started telling me about the strangeness of watching a man who was self-trained being eulogized by folk who were in institutions largely because of training they had received because of him or because of people in his group who have now been incorporated into the capitalist structure. And we walk a very fine line. When I was here in December, we talked about that notion of the construction of nation in America and the, how we pull from different places. And I know I'm looking at my watch and I haven't even gotten through Requiem. So let me quickly go through Requiem. I want to get to this genealogy. But the point I'm trying to make is that Clark understood that complexity, and Larry, in interrogating what was going on, was raising the question of how do we analyze this tradition? And believe me, if we leave it to others to analyze, they will analyze it for us because they will say that what we're doing right now is quintessentially American. We're constructing an Africa that never existed. We're very comfortable in a place, you know. And so they're saying, y'all ain't Africans, y'all black Americans. That's why you're doing what you do. And that's the, that's, that's the books they're writing about now. So we can be a nation in a nation, but that nation within a nation is a nation informed by the nation that encases it. So it's an American nation within a large, it's a black American nation within a larger American nation. Real sleight of hand that this pulled here. So I want to talk about John Henry Clark as standing in a, in a position of, of questioning how we construct our identity in a way that we can practice in a way that will help us understand what we do do because of what has happened here and what we don't do because of the things that we're able to survive Africa. But I want to talk about it in terms of the nature of Requiem. Brian, can I get the next? Thanks. What does Requiem mean? Why would I even pick that, time, that term? Basic definition. Requiem, very basically, and we have a, in addition to Medinetia, we have a Latin and Greek scholar sitting in the front row in, a number of number, in, in addition to a number of languages, Dr. Obinga, who could give a, probably a, a day lecture on this word. And maybe we'll get him to talk a little bit about it in addition to other things he's going to talk about tomorrow. Requiem, basically from the Latin requiem, the accusative of requies, rest. The first word of the introit in the Mass for the Dead. Some of y'all Catholics, some of y'all Roman Catholics, some of y'all know about the liturgies that are given and, you know, the rituals, that kind of thing. A special mass said a song for the repose of the souls of the dead, also mass of requiem. Number two, any dirge or solemn chant for the repose of the dead. They would say the word repose again. Number three, an invitation to rest or repose. Number four, rest, repose, peace, quiet. Well, let's look at the word repose, repose. And these are taken from the Oxford English Dictionary. That's the, that's the one white folks like to use when they go, you know, because it gives you the history of the words as according to their, their perspective. Repose, temporary rest or cessation of, that should be of, activity. In order to refresh or restore the physical or mental powers, especially the rest by sleep. So we're not talking about a physical passing and he's gone. We're talking about the nature of requiem. Rest, repose. Temporary cessation of activity. Now we look at that tradition coming out of the European tradition. Then we see it coming out of the African tradition. Because in the African tradition, we also see that we go through these liturgies, we go through these requiems, but we do them to entreat upon the ancestors for help, for guidance, for wisdom. We communicate with the ancestors. So this notion of having a mass or a prayer is not foreign to Africa. As a matter of fact, let me see if I can find the brother uh, who wrote this text. I can't think of his name off the top of my head. Well. He said that there are hmm, hmm, a number of different 
liturgies of repose. They're grounded in the presumption that the physically absent have entered an ancestral posture which affords them an exponentially increased potential for intervention in the affairs of the physically present. Now that they're gone, they can really help us. So, when we're engaged in a requiem for John Henry Clark, we're asking for intervention in our concept of requiem. What has your passing, what can your passing teach us? What can we now receive from you through this ritual asking for your assistance? Now y'all know what John Henry Clark used to say about prayer. The highest form of prayer is service. So as we talk about this entreating, this prayer, this ritual, this liturgy, we already know what we can do to evoke the spirit of John Henry Clark. And that's engaged in the praxis, in the type of action steps based on the text of his life, how he lived it, and what he did during his life that we can pull, the things from which we can pull to use as a model. That's our requiem for a timekeeper. History is a clock. It tells the people their political time of day, political cultural time of day. It's a compass, which people use to find themselves on the map of human geography. Now, if there's a map, and there's a person who maps out the map on the compass, we don't have a direction without the compass person. If there's a, a clock, we got to have a timekeeper. Somebody who can keep us grounded in the constant notion of who we are, because the, con the concept of the timekeeper is a subject position. That's the person that constructs your subject. What time is it? If you can't tell time, you, don't, you have no sense of place. No sense of being, no sense of purpose that you can ground against some notion of space and time. What time is it? Ask the timekeeper. Who happens when the timekeeper goes off the scene? Long little spirit of the million man march. What time is it? Why I oppose the million man march? Is it why I oppose black nationalism? No. Maybe I'm trying to see what time it is. What time is it? It's 10 minutes to 4. I don't want to know it's 10. No, it's five. It's got to be five o'clock. Why? Because it's too early. I can't wait another hour. I got to go home. Work is not. No, it's 10 minutes to four. I, five, look, I get out of here at five o'clock. It's got to be five o'clock. Time is not negotiable in that sense. If you get off work at five o'clock, you can't make it be anything but 10 minutes to four, no matter how hard you try. Don't get mad at the timekeeper. You know why? Because if you try to walk out of there at 10 minutes to four, you're going to get fired. You need the timekeeper to keep you in the context. Timekeeper's not your friend. The timekeeper's the timekeeper. <laughs> John McClark Clark understood that better than any individual I've ever encountered. Timekeeper's not your friend. Or is she? Why would you even want to keep time? Because you understand the central importance of identity. The central importance of having people aware of where we are on that map of human geography and what time it is. Whether they like you or not, your love for them is so great that you'll tell them what time it is even when they say, we don't want to know what time it is. That's John Henry Clark's indispensable function. That means when he's gone, we got to pick that up. John Henry Clark would raise issues that everybody else would talk about behind closed doors in the hotel rooms after the conference or in the hallways. That's the role of the timekeeper. I got to keep time. I don't care whether you like me or not, because I love you enough not to care right now. What do you say? I got one foot in the grave, I'm too old, and I don't care. He would say that toward the end of his physical moment. Right, give me the next, please. That should be the genealogy. I'm going to look a little bit at the genealogy of John Henry Clark's life. I've been talking for 26 minutes. He said I got an hour, so I'm about halfway through. This is going to take up most of the time. The Clark genealogy is connecting three. The dates in bold represent the periodization of his life. That's his physical life. The dates in italics represent a periodization of 20th century Africana studies. I just want to kind of give, play those two off one another. And Dr. Carruthers brought us, as he always does, with such eloquence. In terms of the Africana library, the translations that have been done over the past 30 years by Africans such as uh, uh, Jetty Shimshu Jehudi and the Chicago School, and those Africans who have retranslated those texts have to be collected because we're beginning to put our, uh, our texts together. And we've relied on those texts like uh, uh, Baba Asa's uh, teachings of Tao Tef and Larry Williams and, and Nia Damali for a long time. Those texts have kept us anchored. So we have some of those books in that great African library. 
But what I want to touch, so he brought us from the Nile all the way up to the 20th century. I just want to go back over the last roughly 100 years or so and kind of give us a little bit of a grounding context in a sense. In 1897, I start that in terms of, and when I want to talk about Africana studies, I want to talk about Africana studies as we began to receive it. The notion of professional work, disciplined work, this notion of the university that we get. We got our PhDs and white folks were some kind of mad. Let me tell you, when all those Africans from the Mid-Atlantic region, the Southern region, the Eastern region came, and Zynga came, Jake Carruthers, remember I knee on the dissertation committees, uh, DFL Obinga is, is the chair of the dissertation committees, and we filled up an auditorium just a little bit smaller than this with Africans, and the provost of the university took off her entire afternoon to come watch those dissertation defenses because she could not believe that the African community would come up on the campus of a white institution and confer degrees. It was the most amazing ritual I ever seen in my life. Yes, sir. And when Zinga Heru came on stage and conf she conferred the degree, she said, okay, y'all got it. Now, mind you, in the dissertation process, your committee is supposed to do that, and they're supposed to only do it after you turn your dissertation in a couple of weeks after that by the graduate school, but the provost sat there quiet while the African queen conferred our degree the same day. <laughs> now, understand the importance of that moment, because see, that's what Temple University was supposed to be about when the place got started. It wasn't supposed to be about anything else but creating some safe space for exactly that kind of ritual, which I'm ashamed to say is the first time that's ever happened like that in the 10 years of that doctoral program. That was what was supposed to be about every dissertation. That's the only reason I came near. That's the only reason I stayed. And that's the reason I can stand before you now and say that any institutional legitimacy I have came from you. Right came from you. Now, but I bring it up and I want to frame this in the context of Africana studies because as we think about black studies today, we usually link it to those things like, you know, departments of black studies, Africana studies, because those are the sites that our scholars have been able to scratch and claw and get in that will allow us some space to begin that intellectual work. And as we move toward the African university, we'll come up out of those places. But in the meantime, over the past century, it's been defined by those kind of places. 1897, I began 1897 because that was the year of the founding of the American Negro Academy. When we were in Alabama a couple of years ago on the 100th anniversary of the American Negro Academy being founded, I talked about that a little bit. The notion of Alexander Cromwell, W.E.B. Du Bois, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, and others came, coming together to form this independent black think tank in Washington, D.C. I want to talk a little bit about the fact, and that's why I marked it in 1897, because that, that's a significant moment in the notion of professionalization of black studies, because those men and women, Anna Julia Cooper was also a, a member of the American Negro Academy. Those Africans were recognized primarily because of their institutional training. We begin to see a shift in the late 19th century from the Africans who came out of enslavement, who preserved the African traditions, to this notion of the professional, particularly the teacher and the preacher, who now had to go to seminary. As Booker T. Washington said, these Negro preachers are not lettered and they're ignorant, and then Bishop Walters of the AME Zion Church, as Claudrina Harold has done a lot of work on, on the AME Zion Church over the course of her research career. She's here uh, from Notre Dame. She's getting a doctorate in history. Walter says, yeah, I'm not mad at you because you said it, Booker T. I'm mad because you didn't go far enough. <laughs> this is the head of the AME Zion Church, because it's notion now that you got to have a degree. you got to go to seminary. So professionalization of knowledge by the end of the 19th century, we begin to see that. Uh, Dr. Clark is born in 1915, Union Springs, Alabama. This is the early period. 1915 is an important cultural moment. We see the globalization of American identity begin to come in. America's constructing an identity that's based on being American. Militarism comes in, industrial empires being built. They're in Haiti invading. They've been invading in Philippines, Cuba. Dr. Du Bois writes an important article in 1915, The African Roots of the War, which talks about World War I's coming up, and this is all really about African resources as these white nations begin to construct their identity based on stealing, continuing to steal. And you know all those white ethnic groups coming to America at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. Booker T. Washington says in Atlanta in 1895, why are you going to these European immigrants when we're here to help you? But one thing Booker T. Washington did not understand, or perhaps he did because he did get some money because he was able to make that speech and they give him some money to build an institution, so maybe he's playing a game. But we see in the text one thing that he did not perhaps articulate at the time was that the reason they're turning to those white ethnics is not because they like them, because God knows if you leave Europe to Europe, they'll make niggas, whether they be the Italians or the Italians are making it out of Sicilians, or you know, they'll go on a descending order. They'll, they'll go to them rather than you because they are not, thank heaven, you, as uh, James Baldwin would say. So they're all white. They become white when they come to America. 
But what we see is that in order to build an American identity, it's not enough to say you're white because black people, we got to go out and find some more non-Europeans to oppress, to build up ourselves, to engage in this global empire building by the end of the uh, 19th century. 1898, Cuban-American War, they intervened in something they had no business doing in. But some people say they blew up their own ship in Cuba, remember the main, to create this manic hysteria to go invade somebody's country. And here we are still hating Castro because America still got it in their mind that they got to oppress other people. But they're building this empire, so that's going on in 1915. Birth of a nation, the cultural logic of Jim Crow comes out in 1915. So we see that white racist identity constructed on not being black, the Klansmen. Political resistance to this tradition, we see them fighting this tradition, Ida, Ida B. Wells, Monroe Trotter. And there's growing class stratification in the African community as we see this notion of the bourgeoisie of the talented 10th begin to separate from the rest of the African group. Booker T. Washington and Henry McNeil Turner both died in 1915. Blyden died in 1912. So we begin to see some of that other guard begin to leave the scene. Intellectual resistance, the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History is founded in 1915. It's Carter Godwin Woodson, a man who worked in the coal mines of West Virginia until he was 20 years old before he could finish high school. A man who read the black newspapers to the miners who worked in those coal mines. And then when he started the general Negro history, wrote about his recollection of veterans of the Civil War to preserve their narratives. A man who vowed to reconstruct African history because it was important to know that we have a tradition and to publish those primary documents. Not what I said about it, just here's the document you read it for yourself. He founded the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History in 1915. Dr. Du Bois publishes a small book called The Negro. A very important book. I used it to teach my black and world history class last year. Because it's an old book, but Du Bois articulates a philosophy of history that's grounded in the Nile Valley and comes across Africa before it ever reaches the United States. And when he gets to the United States, he talks about black people being the reason why America is America, because of our labor, because of our uh, notion of morals and character, and because we contributed to the construction of this country with a very African-influenced perspective. That's 1915 in terms of this whole discussion of the exemplars, the tradition. So people say, it's a new idea to talk about Africans as subjects. No, I think you need to go read The Negro. Small book. Very important. And Dr. Clark is born. 1916, of course, Garvey joint gets to the United States. The Journal of Negro History is founded. In 1917, Hubert Henry Harrison comes on the scene. The black socialist publishes his book, The Negro and the Nation. Important because it's the clear space for Garvey in Harlem. A brilliant brother that John Henry Clark talked about all the time. Why? Because Hubert Henry Harrison influenced John G. Jackson, who sponsored John Henry Clark for membership in the Edward Blyden Society. That's how Clark received Hubert Harrison. So that that's why on those tables out there, you can buy a copy of When Africa Awakes by Hubert Henry Harrison, because John Henry, with a preface by John Henry Clark, because John Henry Clark made it his business, as we get to the, the section on the, uh, the exemplars, made it his business to write prefaces for books largely that he read when he was in that formative period in the 30s. Very important. The most influential ASCAC study group is the Edward Will My Blyden Society. Why? Because half the books that are in the genealogy that we read today, from Flora Shaw, Lugard's Tropical Dependency, to Hubert Henry Harrison's book, Church for Arcy, come out of that study group. And the people who shepherded them forth, John Jackson, John Henry Clark, are those people who were around that study group. So Hubert Harrison comes on the scene in 1917. And I just want to mention, of course, because it would be sacrilege not to mention it in terms of a cultural analysis of the, of the America that John Henry Clark was born into. 1917, of course, Paul Robeson at Rutgers. Robeson, who constructed a notion of African culture based through music and language by studying a number of different, different African languages and constructed this notion of rhythm and music theory, which said that we are Africans first, foremost. And this was one of his geniuses that has gone really not commented upon as, as uh, people like Martin Duberman write huge books on Paul Robeson and just want to talk about who he slept with or might, maybe who he didn't sleep with, and not about the cultural logic of Paul Robeson, a man who studied languages from the inside out, and through that study began to understand we are African people, not through secondhand understanding, but through a firsthand understanding. So, I gotta speed this up. 1918, the end of World War I, triggers more unrest, Africans come home, this lynch war begins, or continues, the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, the second Pan-African Congress, and that's why we're going to England in 2000, because the first one was 1900 with Henry Sylvester Williams. UNIA has the first international conference in New York in 1920. 1925, The New Negro is published. Seminal moment for Clark. We know the genealogy. We've seen the film. We've read his narratives. We've heard him speak. We know why The New Negro was so important, because of that article by Arthur Schomburg that John Henry Clark read. The Negro digs up his past. 
that car said, I asked if I had a history. People said, no, I didn't want to believe that. Schomburg showed me I did. And then I went to look for him to find it. I asked him to go to Chicago, got turned around some kind of way, ended up in New York, went to see Arthur Schomburg. By the late, now, he's, he's coming to New York now. Garvey's deported in 1927. Hubert Henry Harrison dies in 1927. John McClarty never met Hubert Henry Harrison. Why is he so fascinated with Hubert Henry, Hubert, Hubert Henry Harrison, and why do we talk about him today? Jackson wrote a pamphlet, Hubert Henry Harrison, the Black Socrates, but it was Clark who returned the favor of John G. Jackson toward the end of Jackson's life by beginning to reintroduce us to John G. Jackson, hence his preface in the book Introduction to African Civilizations, which he encouraged John Jackson to write. John Jackson, one of the most brilliant scholars we produced in the 20th century, John Jackson, a man who John Henry Clark said could have passed for white and often toward the end of his life regretted that he didn't because he was bitter at the fact that he thought black people had ignored him, but it was John Henry Clark who pulled John Jackson in many ways out of that shell and helped keep him alive in our names, in our mouths, the exemplars of constructing identity. What does it mean? Remember, it was John Jackson who inspired John Henry Clark and who introduced him for membership in the Blyden Society. It was John Jackson and Willis Huggins who wrote a book, well, I'll get to that in this next section, wrote a book called Introduction to African Studies, Introduction to African Civilizations with Main Currents in Ethiopian Thought, where they actually did a survey of black colleges to find out if they were teaching black studies. This is a survey in a book. Introduction to African Civilization. That's not Introduction to Black Studies by Maulana Karinga, an excellent text that's used all over the country. That's Introduction to African Civilizations in the 1930s by John G. Jackson and Willis Nathan Huggins, the first black to get a PhD from history at Fordham University. A man who they say either committed suicide or was killed and whose, whose death had a profound effect on a young John Henry Clark. Let me get to the next section, 1933, 1940, intellectual and activist incubators. John Henry Clark comes to New York. 1915 to 1934, just above that, the institutionalization, the professionalization. What does that mean? 1915, Du Bois's book comes out. 1934, that's bracketed wide. 1934, Du Bois writes Black Reconstruction in America. From 1915 to 1934, you start to see a few black intellectuals, so to speak, accepted by the academy or ensconced at black institutions. So you begin to see the early institutionalization of black studies as a profession. They don't call it black studies, they're in English departments, they're in history departments, they're in sociology departments, but it's black studies in that sense. And by the mid-1930s, when Gunnar Myrdal begins stealing what eventually becomes an American dilemma, it is fueled by the research of a lot of these people who come of age in that period. 1933, 1940, we see John Henry Clark in New York. He enters the Harlem History Club in 1934, sponsored by John Jackson, organized, led by Willis Nathan Huggins. Intriguing, it, it's very interesting. Participants include Kwame Nkrumah and Namde Ezekiel, which I'm going to talk about. We know that history. 1935, what I want to talk about, the Harlem History Club, the Blyden Society, intervenes along with the guidance of Willis Nathan Huggins in something called the Italia Ethiopian War. It's a study group getting involved in praxis, a study group that sends Huggins to Geneva, J.A. E. Rogers to Ethiopia to cover the war for the African-American press. Fantastic documentary. Some of you may have seen it. The Black Press, Warriors Without Swords. Great film. We screened it, and the actual director came to Philadelphia, and we had, to have, had a chance to have a little dialogue with him. Really committed brother who actually told the narrative of an independent institution, the Black Press, which carried our sensibilities for a number of years. Uh, uh, James Brunson has done some work, in, particularly in the 19th century, on what the Black Press meant. Can you imagine now Emerge sending somebody to the Sudan to cover the conflict for Emerge so that black people, hell no, you can't remember why, because in late capitalism it's been incorporated. We'd much rather read about Mariah Carey and Brandy. They sent J.A. Rogers to Ethiopia to cover the war versus the Italians for the black press. I don't even imagine that today unless it's the final call. Or some of these small newspapers like the Truth Seeker or the Michigan Citizen or something like that that have been pushed out because we rather watch TV and get little sound bite snippets because late capitalism has that effect on construction of what we call public spheres. It's public spheres. Before the, before the newspaper, there were very small public spheres. Then the radio comes, the public sphere gets bigger because everybody's tuning in and listening to Fibber McGee and Molly or The Shadow or listen to Joe Lewis beat the hell out of some crack. And we have a nationwide community now, a public sphere that's much larger because at the same time when the cracker hits the canvas, a cheer goes up from Harlem to Los Angeles and the public sphere of people who never will meet each other is created. A nation is constructed that way in late capitalism. Come to ASCAC to meet people whose books you may have read or you may have heard a tape by them because late capitalism through technology constructs public spheres among people who never met one another. 
This is, the, this is the era that John Henry Clark came of age in. Wasn't the era he was born into. He comes of age into that era, and that's why the critique that he renders as the timekeeper is so important, because it's not clouded by constructing identity based on exemplars that began in 1976 or 1986. The Italian Ethiopian War, they send these people out. 1936, Jesse Owens. Public sphere, newsreels, radio accounts. The whole black nation is cheering for Jesse Owens because he's an American. Yeah, you can believe that if you want. White people cheering for Jesse Owens because he's an American. Yes, they are. Why? Because they want an American to beat Hitler. But they use the black man to accomplish it, much like they use Jackie Robinson. Thankfully, Jesse Owens lived a little longer than Jackie Robinson because Jackie paid the price for that with his life, dying as early as he did. But it's important to look at the cultural significance of Jesse Owens as an exemplar for American exceptionalism. America wants to put this thing out that we're better than anybody in the world. We are better than anybody in the world. And that we is not just a white we, because a lot of times Africans receive that sensibility and want to construct a narrative that says, as a black Americans, when we go around the world, whether it be to Africa, anywhere else, because we are Americans, we're better than everybody else. American exceptionalism is a theme in American history. So when we touch down in Africa and start asking for air conditioners, and looking down like, what's wrong with y'all niggas? Not everybody. Or get off the bus and everybody got their booba on and the Africans sitting in the clothes that we wear over here looking like, wow, those must be Americans. Not African Americans. Not African Americans. And it's not a critique, it's not something raised in derision. Because often it is accompanied very quickly by, come on, let's see if we can work this out. Because it's not because we don't want to work it out. Our sensibilities have been informed by America. And the fact that we're there is a very much exhibit A evidence that we don't want to be Americans. But the notion of American exceptionalism seeps into our public consciousness because the public spheres that we've used to construct our identity are based in this American cultural logic of we better than everybody in the world. Charles Bartley going after, sticking his elbow on some African's chest, talking about USA on my chest, I'm representing the country. Fool, that's your brother. You know, but American exceptionalism shows you the death, you know. But anyway, 44 minutes and counting, I got 16 minutes. Let me, let me get through this. Uh, Clark delivers in 1937 a lecture entitled An Inquiry into the Racial Identity of Jesus Christ. Also, he talks about he's reading and preaching Marx at this period. His writing appears in Opportunity Magazine, including Santa Claus is a White Man. And of course, we know about his short story, The Boy Who Painted Christ Black. Why is that important? Because Clark, even though he's beginning to study Africa, is still constructing an identity that's based on the rejection of white social and cultural norms. So even though he doesn't quite have all the language yet, he's still working against that and he's looking for ways to express it, which is why people try to claim, oh, he was a Marxist, no, he wasn't a Marxist, I was a fellow traveler for a minute, I was active briefly in the Young Socialist League, but no, I'm looking for answers, and it's grounded in that cultural logic that Hubert Henry Harrison puts down in 1917 in his book, The Negro and the Nation, where he says, race first, not Garvey, Hubert Henry Harrison. When Garvey gets here, you see that language incorporated by Garvey. Very important move. 1938, Schomburg dies. 1940, Willis N. Huggins dies. That brackets his early intellectual development. Those two figures had, can you imagine what it's like to lose your father? Some of y'all know about what it's like to lose a parent. These two men, see, John Henry Clark watched Arthur Schomburg, who spent all his money on books, came out of that tradition of bibliophiles that spend money on books before they spend money on food, break up marriages, ruin families, children won't speak to you. Why you got them damn books in the house? You got books in the bathroom. I'm throwing them damn books away. I'm throwing them damn books away. I'm throwing those books away. Pardon my language, I'm throwing those books away. And we've lost libraries throughout the national community from families who when that one person passed, they threw all that away. Clark saw that lonely struggle. You wonder why certain things he just wouldn't stomach and you couldn't convince him otherwise. I'm riding in a car with Clark in 1991, Columbus, Ohio in a snowstorm. We couldn't get to the place, so we went, to the, uh, went back to his hotel and sat and talked for, at great length for several hours. And I watched tears in his eyes as he talked about Arthur Schomburg. He talked about being poor in New York and having nothing but a rented room in New York and his books. And how happy it made him to finish up working as a dishwasher, setting place tables, get home, finish those books. Finish that last book on a Friday night when everybody else talking about going out, he talking about coming home. That's a ritual of preservation. That's a way of life. 
You can't buy that, nor will they sell it at any price. It's a ritual of preservation. So Schomburg dies, Huggins dies, that mantle gets a little heavier on the shoulders of this young man. Intellectual and activist incubators we've talked about, 1935 to 1950, I talked about the radicalization of African thought. What else is going on in the African world? In 1935, when Du Bois publishes Black Reconstruction in America, which is a revision, critique of the literature on Reconstruction, the people accused him of being a socialist. They put him out of the NAACP. He's too radical. By 1950, you got the Red Scare up. Paul Robeson's passport is gone. Du Bois' passport is gone. People lying on one another. Are you or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? They tried out Jackie Robinson to go against Paul Robeson, which he, which he apologizes for toward the end of his life. They used him against Paul Robeson. Why? Because as this period before, during, and after World War II takes place, global African public spheres are being created as Africans participate in wars in France, again, as they did in World War I, as they meet Africans, as African nations begin formulating their struggles for independence, and Africans in this country, like the Institute of Council for African Affairs, begin linking up with Africans on the continent. William Leo Hansberry becoming a mentor for a number of Ethiopian and East African students. And we begin to see a radicalization of African thought. This notion of radical, anti-American, anti-imperialism, pan-African thought is beginning to rise. John Henry Clark goes to the army. <laughs> 1940 to 1959-60, the constitutive elements of pan-Africanism, a craftsman's apprenticeship. 1941. John McClark goes to the army. He said one of the things that kind of drove him into the army, he lost Willis Huggins in 1940. Young man looking for stability. How many of us have sent our young people off to the army? Or told or young people say, I ain't doing nothing in my life, I'm going to the army. It wasn't that Clark wasn't doing anything in his life, but he decided to go into the army. Maybe a little, needed a little stability, a little structure. Four years, six months, 26 days. People always talk about terms in the army like they spent time in prison. And I guess it has those kind of similar links. But Clark talks about it. One of the things you get from listening to Clark talk about, what does he talk about when he was in the army? His men, how he was a good clerk. Couldn't shoot, but he's a good clerk. And he took care of his men. He took care of his men, his men took care of him. Expands his understanding of the American polity because he's working for the engine of American imperialism, but at the same time, he's expanding his understanding of the nature and dreams of the African-American working class, the grassroots. What's important to the brothers who just trying to make it from day to day? I know, because I feed them, I clothe them, I listen to their problems, I understand what's going on, I make sure their mail gets through. I'm the clerk for these brothers. Right. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? That's what he always talked about in terms of what the experience in the army taught him. Right. Very important to understand because he brings those sensibilities forward in the notion that I will never be an elitist in terms of what I might think I know or what some of y'all might think I know because I understand as Baba Jetty said today speech is more precious than gold can be found among the little girls pounding pound grain found among the brothers in the army that I was a clerk for found among the book collectors that nobody respected but had to go to because they had all the books very important to understand how these sensibilities are constructed and why they weren't demanded. 1945 is discharged from the army. 1945, 1946 through 1952, 1953, Clark picks up his, he, see, he, he says, I pick up my academic career. Harlem Writers Guild, still going back and forth with these communists and socialists, begins his deep studies in African history. He begins attending meetings of the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. Now, if we understand this institution, we know that Woodson was very serious about training scholars. A lot of these guys had degrees, graduate degrees. And here's a guy who's self-taught, trained by the best minds that didn't go to the institution. And now he starts dealing with these cats that got degrees. And you know how cats that got degrees can be. You know, I know. Now, mind you, I got a second-hand degree because it's in black studies and a third-hand degree because it came from Temple. But <laughs> nevertheless, it's a PhD. And I understand what that means in venues when I go to work and my boss tells me, stick PhD on the memo. Why? Because that's the only way they'll respect you. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. Why? Because it's not that important to me. My mother got every degree I got, every piece of paper or whatever I got, from kindergarten all the way up to the PhD. Those are her things. And I don't dismiss with that. I mean, those are her things and my father's things. But understand what I mean because Clark's now entering this sphere with guys who got other kind of wars going on. People like Rayford Logan. You know, Woodson dies in 1950. He starts going to these meetings in 1950. Woodson's not there anymore to temper that 
as an African who remembers enslavement, well, 1875, he was born, came in the shadow of enslavement. His parents were enslaved. His mother couldn't read. That's why she forced him to read. But now there's a generation who didn't remember. They're second time removed. They're professionals. And here's this little man coming in, going to talk to us. Meetings were chaired by Walter Fisher of Morgan State College, and he was a stone, staunch anti-communist, according to Clark, so they didn't like Clark too much. Clark, as a protest, doesn't read a paper at the associated meetings during the time of, his, uh, time of this guy's chairmanship, which was seven years. So he was just going soaking up knowledge. Anderson Thompson, a, a brilliant analysis of the relationship of black scholars and white scholars, particularly the second half of the 20th century, talks about how these white scholars like August Meyer would come to the associated meetings and sit in and get the information and go back and write up these monographs that we now teach our children in books like August Meyer, great deal. Okay, where'd he get it from? He sat in on these meetings. Clark's sitting there too. He knows the terrain. Um, Clark works during his period at NBC as a night chief of maintenance. That's what he calls it, then head of the typing food. He says he's influenced by his senior scholars, the Elders Association. 52 minutes, got about eight minutes in here. 1954, Brown versus the Board of Education. Stolen Legacy, African Glory, and Black Nations and Culture are published. That's a watershed moment for us, right? We understand the genealogy past then when we see those, those three texts. We go to Man when we go to London in the year 2000, we'll see J.C. DeGrave Johnson was at that Pan-African Congress in 1945. He was one of the rapporteurs. He's one of the people who's reporting about that. And we see African Glory, his book. It's very important during that period. Um, let me, he makes this, Dr. Clark makes his first trip to Africa in 1958. He sharpens his commentary on African history and culture between 1958 and 1960. He starts writing Lives of the Great African Chiefs. He publishes in Présence Africaine, Wake Keeping Among the Ga People, written on the way home from Africa. Remember, the Ga eulogized him. The Ga were there to do rituals for him during his, uh, his uh, rituals. Why? He got a long relationship with them. His first trip to Africa, he, he writes an article, Wake Keeping Among the Ga People. Radicalization. Let's talk very quickly. Uh, so that's why I kind of bracketed 1960. 1951 and 1965, divergences and proliferations in the Cold War era African studies as the dimension of the construction of African identity. Very quickly, black studies becomes very important. African studies, the studies of the African continent. We know why, because there's a Cold War brewing, and these white folks over here want to have experts on Africa because they're playing checkers with the Russians. So they train all these uh, white folks to be in the leadership in African studies, and John Henry Clark's hanging around the edges of that discourse, yes. which is one of the reasons he ends up affiliated with groups like the African Studies Association, which makes it all the more important when he, when he leads the break with the ASA to form the AHSA with some of the very people in this room. People like Lynn Jeffrey standing out there down in the back, uh, Marimba Ani and uh, Tony Martin, folks like that. When we see that walkout, that's informed by this period of divergences, that Cold War rhetoric, which had the study of Africa first and foremost. Very important to understand. 1960 to 67, Clark's radicalization. Why do I say that? Because that's obviously the 60s, and we can kind of stick a pin in that and keep going, because most of the people here did the 60s, and uh, therefore we learn, and you know better than I do, what that meant in that period, what it meant to be black. It took a whole reconstitution. Dr. Carruthers talks about the fact, and I know he wasn't, but he likes to say he was a Negro until his students radicalized him during the 1960s. We know better than that, but. 1966 to 1979, nationalism emergent. And I say 68 to 83, Professor John Henry Clark. Why 66 to 679, nationalism emerging? It emerges in black studies as a real clear motif as white institutions incorporate the descent of the 60s by giving people black studies programs and then beginning to define the criteria of who teaches them. <laughs> but they never could quite melt Professor John Henry Clark down because some of the people that got incorporated in that resistance came to these white institutions and as a price of admission because of what he did for them, they went and got John Henry Clark and said, you can come to Cornell, James Turner. You got to come to Cornell. Why? Because even though they respect me, it's you that put the book in my hand when I was running crazy in the streets. So therefore, you got to come and teach you and Dr. Ben at Cornell. Never would be there. Becomes Professor John Henry Clark. That's a weird moment in time. A throwback. Walking the halls of Ivy with no degrees. Harold Cruz played the trick, but the price he paid for, for doing the trick was talking about black people. Some people can get in Ivy League institutions without degrees. Black people usually do it by kicking other black people in the teeth. But Clark did it because some of the people who snuck up into those institutions as a result of that black studies wave and the white institution tried to incorporate black studies some of those people remembered the debt they owed John Henry Clark, and so they pulled him forward into that, and that's what introduced him to a whole nother generation. And here's where most of us come in. Because black studies for us is an institutional thing in many ways. Not always, many ways. 
56 minutes. Oh, wow, okay, all right, can I come a little quicker? Matter of fact, I should just abandon my outline and just keep going, because I mean, I I, there's a lot of other things I wanted to talk about, but I did a year-by-year -year thing on Dr. Clark, but I don't have time. Uh, 83 to 87, intellectual insurgency institutionalized, building for eternity. Yes. Now some of these Africans who've been in these institutions come together under the leadership and the influence of these elders, their elders like John Henry Clark, Yosef Ben Yakinen, Chancellor Williams, John G. Jackson. Williams is an anomaly of sorts because he has a PhD, 1949, American University in History. Although he dabbles in the arts, his book, Have You Been to the River? If you've ever read Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man and the, the critiques of the Negro Church, if you read Chancellor Williams's book, Have You Been to the River? I'm wondering, did Ralph Ellison just steal wholesale from Chancellor? Did he at least read this? Very interesting, because the book's based on his dissertation. And he writes about those storefront churches, which he knew through his family. Very interesting critique. A little bit of an anomaly, but these other guys largely self-trained. Although they say he, Dr. Ben, has no PhD, and I won't enter that debate at this moment because we continue to move along. It doesn't matter because we confer them, just like I, my degree was conferred. I feel like my degree, my legitimacy was conferred the same way that, I, that Dr. Ben Yakinen's degree was conferred and John Henry Clark as well. I don't care what Temple University says, when y'all came and conferred that degree upon me, and I know that my colleagues feel the same way and Afia feels the same way out of Clark Atlanta, when y'all conferred, that was the conferation that matters. So, of course, we all got PhDs long before anything, and that goes for everybody else in this room that does work. Doesn't matter. But what I'm trying to make is now, 83 to 87, these institutional scholars, with the guidance of these, this other generation, begin to form and continue to form, and I didn't have time to go through that period, uh, 60, uh, well, 68 to 83, because during that period, there's also some institutional movement. Uh, certainly places like Chicago, the Afrocentric World Review, the Association of African Historians, they place, things like that. Of course, New York, the whole movement in New York, first world, those things. And I'm looking, I got 58 minutes, count up, 15 minutes, I'm gonna try to bring it up. Um, Intellectual insurgency, institutionalized building for eternity, we see ASCAC form because we gotta have something outside of these walls so we can begin to move completely outside of these walls. And it's informed by a lot of the institutional thinkers, but it's also informed by the logic of John McClark, uh, 1980 to present, the commodification of African intellectual insurgency. Now it's a real big commodity, and you see Dr. Clark the last decade of his life, Resistance Incorporated. In 80 to the present, the Afrocentric public sphere and the African Senate public sphere. Afrocentricity is a funny thing, and I always harp on this because I ain't going to get off of it because I think that one of the functions of anybody who wants to be a timekeeper, I'm not one, I would like to aspire to apprentice in that tradition, is to tell the time. The term's been cut and dried, and we can't fight no war over uh, words and language in terms of those kind of nomenclature, but in terms of incorporated resistance, it's a profit industry for a lot of people and a lot of institutions. And John Henry Clark was consistent over the last decade of his life of saying, look, this tradition extends way beyond the last 20 years. And that's why he always ran the genealogy to ground us in that and pull certain people out of genealogy to give us exemplars. And can we move very quickly, very quickly, Brian, to the next over here. This, these are the major things of sentimental on one level, an adept mimic or a secret outcast on another. Being skilled at survival becomes the main imperative with the danger of getting too comfortable and secure constituting a threat that is constantly to be guarded against. We live to exist, and we hate stuff. I always go to those rituals. I go all over, any place I'm in the country, I go look at the rituals of white supremacy and look at how black people negotiate that. Went to the Macy's Parade and watched Klaus hit that corner in the rain and watched those crackers go up in a cheer and watched the television cameras broadcasting it over the entire world as a public sphere. And as soon as, Kraut, as, as Klaus hit that corner in front of Macy's, the cameras went down, the show was over. The parade went on for another 20 minutes. But the importance was to reify this notion of Christmas, and I'm standing there watching black people with their babies watching Klaus. And I'm saying, look at this construction. They don't like that white boy, but this is a ritual that they have to bond with their kids. Watching July 4th in Philadelphia, watching Africans come down to the Liberty Hall to watch them read the Constitution, watching them play the Star Spangled Banner and no black mouths move, and then watching that same band perform the battle hymn of the Republic and watch black people start singing. Why? Because that's where we come into the narrative. Read Du Bois, Black Reconstruction, I believe it's chapter three, The General Strike. African people intervened in the Civil War, won our own freedom, and that's why for us, if you're gonna pick between them two songs, it's the battle hymn of the Republic that reads the memory of subjectivity. We fought in this war, and I'm gonna sing America, I'm at least gonna sing the battle hymn, but if I had a preference, I would sing something African, but since I don't know the language, I feel in my heart this is as close as I can get. Half detachments, half involvements. John Henry Clark, by straddling that 
boundary, understood the importance of validating the sensibilities that makes that elder African sing the battle hymn of the Republic, while at the same time giving him the tools to recover the language of Africa that would allow him to move beyond it. That was the gift of John Henry Clark. I'll close with his words. Thank you, Bobby Chain. That's my ancestors. I'll close with his words. History is a clock. People use to tell their political and cultural time of day. It's a compass that we use to find ourselves on a map of human geography. History of a people tells them who they are, but more importantly, it tells them where they must go, what they still must be. The relationship of people to his history is the relationship of his child to his mother. We keep John Henry Clark alive by following his example. I shake. Thank you. Thank you.